show today, um, the hate rhetoric of Te Pāti Māori. We talked about it yesterday in an extraordinary interview on Q&A uh, with uh, Māori Party co-leader Debbie Narewa Packer, and um, she was being interviewed on Q&A by Jack Tame of Television New Zealand. It was an extraordinary in the sense that it suggested that a genocidal white um, supremacist government was currently occupying uh, the primary uh, seats in Wellington and committing, uh, without exception, genocide upon the Maori people of this country. Um, extraordinary in the sense that uh, when Jack Tame sought to obviously uh, question those assertions made by Debbie and Arava Packer, she simply actually didn't provide any detail of it. She just went on to say that genocide was underway, that white a white supremacy government was still in place, uh, and it was genocidal in that they are seeking to take away everything that is good from Maori and eradicate Maori. I actually wrote down some of the phrases that she used because it seemed that at a time when Donald Trump can change potentially the culture of a country and the speech that he's just about to deliver in Milwaukee in Wisconsin, um, and an understanding in the United States of America from both sides of the political divide that their rhetoric has led to a violence that has scared them now and made them aware of the circumstances that they ironically have created in some way, and that we have talked about hate speech um, becoming so much a lexicon of social media in this country, the leader of Te Pāti Māori and one of New Zealand's leading members of parliament, after all, uh, there are six Te Pāti Māori MPs in the House, uh, could suggest to all of those heat-fevered individuals out there that a white supremacist government bent upon the extermination, eradication and genocide, that was the word used, genocide of Māori, is underway and that Te Pāti Māori is fighting some kind of war, the only word that you could describe, cultural, political at the moment, against the worst instincts of a government determined to eviscerate Māoridom in toto. To talk to us about that, um, and we have invited Te Pāti Māori to uh, come on to the show repeatedly to try and justify those points of remarks. They have refused. They'll only talk to certain media, it would appear, and then only if they get a free ride. Um, we are interested in one of the government's leading Māori members, uh, a member steeped, it would seem, uh, in the culture of his forefathers, uh, and more importantly, with a significant role in terms of policy development in this country. Um, we're joined by the Honourable Shane Jones. Shane, thank you very much for coming on to the show, and I would... Oh, I can't put Shane on. So could you please put Shane on for me, Josh? Thank you, Shane. Uh, sorry, mate, sorry, I was trying to put you on, Shane, and I couldn't. Welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, kia ora. Good morning, folks. Listen, um, I'm interested, Jane, you are one of New Zealand's leading Māori politicians. Uh, this parliament has more members of parliament, I think, of Māori descent than any parliament in the history of New Zealand. Are you a white supremacist government? Are you all a bunch of Uncle Toms, which seems to be the suggestion of Te Pāti Māori? Yeah, I had an unusual, well, not an unusual, but a distinctive journey to Parliament. I, my church, the Anglican Church, provided me with a scholarship and the support of my parents. I went to St. <coughs> Stephen's oh, okay. School as a teenager. Yep. Uh, sadly, um, my, uh, my, my capacity for uh, language was adversely related to my ability on the rugby field, so I was a minority in that regard. But look, what's happened in the New Zealand Parliament is that there are a host nowadays of parliamentarians uh, with Māori ancestry, and the vast majority of it, uh, whilst we're very proud of it, we do not believe in blood shaming. Blood shaming has become the rage of the Māori Party, and they have now come up with a term called momo tototo, which means you are a blood traitor. They have oh. turned into a toxic mix of ideological bigotry 
the concept that if you are possessed of Māori ancestry, there is only a certain way that you should behave. And if your character does not meet the measuring stick of the Māori Party, then you are not only blood-shamed, but you now are regarded as a blood traitor. And no one has perfected that art more than uh, the Dolores of our parliament. That's that uh, demented teacher out of Harry Potter who became fanatical in, the, in her sort of pursuit of blood being the basis upon which you establish a person's character for those of your listeners who may know of Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. So for the rest of us, uh, like myself, who uh, celebrate all of our backgrounds, from Croatian, Welsh, but more importantly, our party, and I accept as a parliamentarian, that there's only one way forward for the country. We have to empower ourselves as individual citizens through growing our economy, constantly moving towards being a well-adjusted citizen, and um, standing against this latest display of bigotry as put on the television recently by Debbie. And basically their policy is to run a blood directory. And you always have to be pure. So if you belong to uh, the government, or if you belong to New Zealand first, and you're mixed Māori ancestry like we all are, then you're regarded as something as a political mudblood. Now, that's how distorted and that's how twisted uh, her ideology has become. And sadly, she gets a free pass far too often. Yeah, and that's the bit that concerns me um, because it's that free pass, particularly from the mainstream, Shane, and also from organisations like the Race Relations Commissioner, the Human Rights Commission, that would normally call out this kind of activity were it coming from any other ethnic or cultural group. Why is she given a free pass? Well, it's certainly something... I did notice a change in in tone and character from the times of Tilda or Flavel, who was our head boy at St. Stephen's School, I might say. And um, after he left the field of play, and I was out of politics from 2014 to 2017, uh, I've noticed an extraordinarily uh, different, far more damaging approach from the Māori Party. They're, they're not a political party. Uh, they, they are a group, as I said, who believe um, that uh, that their pure that, that, that their concept of how Māori should develop as a part of uh, our broader society is driven by their um, their blood uh, their, their, their sort of their blood shaming approach. That was never a feature of any parliament I've been in, and I, I think it grew because of the way Jacinda and elements of her regime. Uh, either enabled or they were afraid to take on these excessive displays of separatism and, quite frankly, fanaticism. And um, sadly, we've got the Māori Party hoping to radicalise a whole new generation of young voters with this blood-shaming ideology. Well, and that's the issue here. Uh, they had to capture six of the seven Maori seats, Shane, which would suggest that their message is starting to take hold, particularly amongst Maori electors, yeah? Well, you need to bear in mind that the Maori party themselves come from a self-styled elite portion of the broader Maori community. Uh, they have created an ideology that is built upon a separatist, a separatist conception of the Treaty of Waitangi. The Treaty of Waitangi, a foundation document, is an inseparable, uh, indivisible statement of a, rate, of, of a set of principles upon which our nation eventually evolved. And, that, and history is never perfect. But because they only have an interest in elevating the Māori words of the Treaty of Waitangi, overlooking the fact that it was a blend. Now, that charter, or that um, uh, cantankerous creed that they're spreading, is driven to 
isolate themselves in a tiny portion of the political spectrum and they're hoping to attract more supporters. But just like out of the Harry Potter fictional tales, pure bloods inevitably die out. They continually inbreed and then they become enfeebled. And the Māori Party refuses to reach out and accept that the current circumstances of New Zealand with 5 million plus people is that we not only face dire uh, political and economic challenges, but we're all in the same waka. There is no other, no one's coming over the horizon to save us. But that type of thinking is regarded as mud blood thinking. I understand, I understand your criticism. I understand that, and, 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 and I don't disagree with you, Shane. But the reality is that they have obviously um, utilised that, uh, well, if you like, radicalism. Um, their, 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 their preaching, if you like, of Maori sovereignty, uh, even coming up just recently with the declaration of Maori political independence, um, to radicalise, as you say, um, the, a new generation of voters as well. Um, genocide's a very powerful word, and so is a white supremacist uh, government. Those are powerful words. How long before someone, addled, perhaps drugged, poorly educated, resentful, disassociated from our community, like many individuals are in the Western world, takes these, this rhetoric seriously and imposes some form of harm, physical, upon others? Well, at, at the recent election, there's always a very low turnout um, in the Māori seats. So yep. you're always going to get quite odd results in the Māori seats because as you know, New Zealand first campaigned to have a referendum to get rid of the Māori seats. But uh, we ourselves obviously got 6.2% of the vote and there was no mandate at all for us to, to run such an agenda. But you need to bear that in mind and you need to bear in mind the vast majority of Māori New Zealanders are not on the Māori roll. And the vast majority of Māori New Zealanders did not give their party vote to the Māori party. And I think this time round, as they witness the escalation of uh, incendiary inflammatory rhetoric and it cheapens language but then yes, they're yes. not they're, they're, they're not interested in the fact that they are um, cheapening that they are diminishing the potency of language they're only driven at a surface superficial level to appeal to a group who they're hoping will base their lives around the mentality of victimhood and grievance culture and other than Winston and myself, I really don't see too many other MPs of um, Māori descent taking on that odious mix of, um, of ideological... Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite nasty, really. OK, now, given... Okay, so, so there's a general, I think there's a general agreement upon what you're saying, but haven't we got a Human Rights Commission that regularly calls out groups within the community who essentially incentivise other groups or use um, words or rhetoric that are hateful directed at a group, other groups in our society. They, they seem conspicuously silent at the moment. Can I just ask Shane, what the hell's the point of them? Yeah, well, you've heard our leader talk about, and myself talk about such organisations on numerous occasions. But let's just go through those words that you referred to. Genocide, okay. There is absolutely nothing that any fair-minded, rational, sentient Kiwi would associate that the government is involved with in terms of genocide. It is a word with narrow, ugly, uh, menacing connotations that belongs in the discussion with Nazi Germany. So the fact that those organisations or indeed the broader media are unwilling to call yeah. out. But if I came out yeah. and used even mildly <coughs> misogynistic language, I'm the one who's shot down. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I've got a bit of trunk in me, so I just carry on and do my job. Now, those particular organisations, I suspect, feel that the Māori Party deserves a free pass because they're less a political party, they're a bunch of activists. But other than that, I've no idea why they're not doing your job. 
No, no way. Um, just uh, look, I've, the, 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 it's interesting. I went to the United Nations to get a definition of genocide because I thought, well, I might as well use something that everybody can at least reference. Um, and a, a genocide is a crime committed with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group in whole or in part. Those are very serious words. Um, and if somebody was to take them seriously and be radicalized by them, and seek to take arms against a, a white supremacist government, um, then that would place, just if you look at the rhetoric of the United States in particular, and you don't really want that to arrive in New Zealand on our shores, Shane, that would place people like yourself in some danger, I would think. Well, the reality is um, the current members of the Māori Party caucus don't even know how to spell the word. They've never read a book. Uh, beyond uh, the Fenton comic, The Ghost in Walks. They have no conception of the broad sweep of historical movements that have uh, vanquished or, or <coughs> marginalised people. They seem to believe that they themselves are a voice uh, of indigenous purity for marginalised people. Māori are not marginalised in New Zealand. Māori sure have a host of equity challenges not much different, quite frankly, from the Pacific community. Mm. Not much different from the first generation of migrant communities. And what you're really dealing with is the transformation through the misuse of language and the free pass, the transformation by uh, Debbie Packer, who herself must be a constant war because she, she's a muggle like myself. When you yes. start to associate yes. character with blood, then mm. look in the mirror. The fact that you and I in 2024 are even having this discussion uh, about parliamentary blood shaming is an indictment on Maori political culture. And the more and the more uh, and the more frequently that senior figures call out this Harry Potter, Dolores nonsense, the better we're all going to be. Good on you, Shane. Thank you very much for spending some time with us this morning. Much appreciated. Have a great week, mate.